Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastors Jim and Deborah Cobray. And so today, God has given us an assignment. And 26 years ago, when we started this church, we were building a house and we were back in construction. And Jim was just thrilled and he didn't want to start a church, didn't think he was a pastor. And put an offering basket in the back of the room at the Econo Lodge, wouldn't advertise. People had to hear from God to know where we even were because we had to know that it was the will of God and that this was something God wanted and it wasn't just something we thought we should be doing for God. And 26 years later, it's obvious that God has done a wonderful thing and is going to continue to do a wonderful thing. Now, we live in a nation that is filled with great debt. And we are taking this great debt and we're putting it on the backs of the next generation. But I believe in the house of God and I believe the people of God have a big God and we are a smarter people because we've come to a place where God can renew our minds and give us our minds back. Are you with me? Therefore, God says that the borrower is slave to the lender. And it's madness to hand the next generation a church that isn't free and clear if we can do everything in our power to make it so. So we believe that it's God's assignment now. First we built it. Now it's a God assignment on this generation. Let's pay it off and let's believe God to do that. So that this next generation can go further, faster, and go into the highways and byways of this planet and hasten the day of the Lord. Because we're all going to meet God, and this is vapor time here, and we're all going to be glad that we did everything the earth side to get the gospel out. Are you with me? That's the vision of this house. It's multi-generational, multicultural, and I don't know when the Lord's coming, but I know it's close. So we've got to work and do everything we can. So to do that, to pay off this church and to actually do this, there's some things that I wanted to share with you this morning very briefly. And the scripture up on our overhead says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. This church was started in faith. It will continue in faith. And the just shall live by faith. And there's no other way you and I are going to be able to believe God or do anything for God without faith. And so if we're going to pay this church off, and if you and I are going to be used by God to do that, we're going to have to do it in faith. Amen? So I wanted to just look quickly at a little woman in the Old Testament to encourage your faith this morning about God being careful to take care of you and to take care of me. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, God says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The Lord is talking to his people and talking to his disciples, and he's telling them not to worry. He said, why do you worry? Worry doesn't do one thing for you. Why do you worry about what you're going to put on, what you're going to what you're, what you're going to live in, what you're going to eat? Why are you worrying about these things? The Gentiles seek these things, but you, as my people, seek first the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. All these things will be added unto you. And so the Lord tells us not to worry. But I know in this auditorium, there is great worry. Whether you want to admit it or not, every one of us can have the opportunity to worry, to fret, to be anxious over how things are going to get done, how we're going to pay our bills, how we're going to live, and how we're going to give. Can I have a witness? Is that true? Yes. If you were honest, yes. We're going to do it by faith. That's how we're going to do this. And so in 2 Kings, the fourth chapter, I wanted to look at just a little, a little example of faith and about God's carefulness because the Lord said to us in Matthew, the sixth chapter, he says, listen, your heavenly father knows you need these things. He knows you've got to eat. He knows you've got to have clothes. He knows you've got to have homes. He knows we have to pay our bills. He knows our kids need to go to school. He knows these things. And yet, Worrying and fretting over them isn't going to change anything. And giving is God's economic recovery program because God says that the manner that we give is the manner that we'll receive. And Jim's going to share that with you in a minute. But let's look at this about faith and giving. In 2 Kings chapter 4, and I'll just set this scene quickly, there was a widow, and she was married to a prophet. 
And the resident prophet of the land that is famous is Elisha. And Elisha was the disciple of Elijah. Now, Elisha is prophet over Israel. And she is in a very destitute place. And she cries out, and I'm going to read the first verse in chapter 4. And a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets, she cried out to Elisha saying, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant is coming I'm sorry, you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So she's got big trouble, major trouble. Not only is her husband dead, but now she's going to lose both sons, and there was no welfare, there was no public assistance, there was nothing in Israel. When you were a widow, and if you had no children, you'd be out in the streets. It's not going to get worse for her. And so what I like about this woman is the first thing she does in a hard situation is she goes to God. And God says that when you're in difficult times and when things are hard and when you are troubled and when you have the opportunity to worry, the first thing that we need to do is we need to not run from the house of God, but run to the house of God. Run to him because God's the one that has the answers. So Elisha, the first thing Elisha says to this widow is he says, what have you, so Elisha says to her in verse 2, what shall I do for you? He doesn't take out his checkbook. He says, what can I do for you? And he says, what have you got in your house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. And then he said, go, borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons and pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So Elisha says, what have you got? Now, you know, right now we're saying, let's pay this church off. And you might be saying, well, I don't have anything. My house, I lost my house in this recession. I believe in God for a job. But God is saying, what's in your hand? What have you got in your house? What can you do? And she said, when Elisha asked her that question, she said, all I've got is a little jar of oil. Now, oil was olive oil. And olive oil back then was used for everything. It was used for fuel. It was used for anointing. It was used to, for makeup. It was used for medicine. It was used for everything. It was very, very, very valuable. She had a little tiny bit of it. And Elisha says, go take your sons and go get empty vessels. So God says to us, when we go to him and we're in need and we want to see God fill our needs, God says, what have you got? We all have something. Everybody's got something. But she had to go do something. So number one, when you have an opportunity to worry, when you want to run from any kind of giving message or any kind of, oh, here they go again, because you're already stretched as far as you can be stretched. God says, number one, seek me first in the kingdom. Then he says, what have you got? Because when you give God what you've got, God can then take it and do something with it. But she had a responsibility. She had to do something. So part two of this, not only do I have to first seek God in the hard times, but number two, I've got to believe just what this says, believe. That's what Jim and I did when we started this church. Did we want to? No. Did we feel like it? No. But we knew this was what God wanted, and we believed God, and with the belief comes corresponding action. She had to run with her sons, go to her neighbors, and get empty vessels. That was her doing for her believing. And Elisha said, when you get these empty vessels, shut the door, pour the oil. And that's exactly what she did. And they poured that oil, and she kept pouring that oil, and she kept pouring that oil. Obviously, God's miracle was that oil was multiplied. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Her job was to go get empty vessels. God's job was to take the oil and multiply it. Her job was, number one, not to worry, but to go to God. Her job, number two, was not to multiply the oil, but her job was to get the empty vessel so the oil could be multiplied. 
given, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. But first you've got to give. Are you with me? She shut the door, and it says that when the last vessel was full, the oil stopped. And then she goes to the man of God, and he says, go and sell this oil, pay off your debt, and live on the rest. So number three, I've got to hope in God's future. When I give, I've got to do it in faith, but I've got to do it with hope that God's going to do something for me because I need God's supernatural on my natural. Now, here's the thing. That woman's oil kept going as long as she had an empty vessel. When the vessels were full, the oil stopped. Her receiving the miracle of oil was dependent and proportional to how many vessels she, she collected. Are you with me? What I want to say is what I receive from God supernaturally is in direct proportion to what I believe. What I receive is in direct proportion to what I believe. What I receive from God is in direct proportion to what I believe. And what I believe is proved by my works. She went out and got vessels. We are asking God for a miracle to pay this church off. Pastor Jim, come on up. But it's going to take people to do that. And it's going to take faith for you to be able to have the courage to do what you've never done. So what do we do? Number one, let's go to God in hard times because he's got the answers, the supernatural answers to everything we need. Number two, we've got to do it in faith. We're going to have to go get vessels. What's in your hand? God wants to do something with what we already have. And number three, we're going to have to do it with hope because God's the God that takes the little and makes it much. You know, it's interesting that if she had collected more pots and vessels, she would have had more oil. The oil didn't run out until the pots and vessels. So it was really based on how much she did as to what God did. And that's what Deborah's saying. Now listen closely to what I'm going to say to you. I'll just share some things with you real quick. First of all, a man came to me not too long ago, a young man, asked me a question. It was kind of an insulting question, but it was a good question when I stopped and thought about it and I, I could see where he was coming from. He made this question. It was kind of a question that was also a backhanded insult, but I didn't look at it that way. He said these, these words to me. He says, why don't you just believe God to pay this church off and um, stop asking the people for money? And when I heard it at first, you know, it kind of bothered me, but then I stopped and thought about it for a young man, that's what he's thinking. But what he doesn't realize, and a lot of you that think the same way out there today, is that you got to see that God uses people. And this is not something that you believe God for and Tinkerbell flies over and you know sprinkles fairy god dust on you. It is not something that, you know, Legoland pops out of a plastic box. This is not something that belongs in a Disney movie. God uses people all the time. And in your life and in my life, in order to accomplish something, it's got to be something that not only God wants to do, it's his will and it's his plan, but his will and his plans carried out by his people. In fact, let me show you a verse that Debbie quoted earlier in Luke, the sixth chapter, verse number 38. It says this, given it shall be given unto you, good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over. First thing he says right off the bat, number one, is the word give. Nothing's going to happen until you have a heart to do this. He didn't say sit back, believe me that the money's going to fall out of the sky or the job's gonna come, or the finances will be just supernaturally take care of, you don't have to do anything. 
He really says something. You're going to have to do something. You're going to have to give. And it shall be given to you. You can't outgive God. Remember last week with Pastor Dan, he made that statement. You just can't outgive God. You're not going to. But then he tells it's going to be given in such a way, it's going to be a good measure. It's going to be pressed down. It's going to be shaken together, running over. In other words, it's more than you even gave. But then he makes this brilliant statement, shall men give unto your bosom. The very vehicle by which your blessing is out there is going to come through men stimulated by God. And a lot of times people don't realize that. In fact, let's take a look at your check every week that you get from work. Somebody signed it. Somebody paid the price for that company. Somebody made it happen, hired you. Men, God uses all the time. We're always waiting for God to do something. Why is it, Pastor, you just don't believe God? Well, how many of you know that I don't believe God? I believe God enough to bring in the people that are going to be the very vessels that need to get the job done. So we are believing God. Shall men give on to your bosom? Last week, let me just read a little story. I got uh, on email uh, last week. I received this from someone in the church. I thought it was kind of cool. I thought, thought I'd read it to you. It's a testimony about freedom for the future. And, um, and I want you to see how God used men to bring blessings to this person. She starts off by saying this. Just wanted to say unto you, thank you for letting me and my family be part of freedom for the future. And that, that in itself is a miracle that someone says thank you for letting me be part of freedom for the future. I, that caught my eye right there, you, you can imagine. It has been a challenge to give because I'm the only one working. My husband is sick. We're waiting for a disability to take place. So needless to say, we've been struggling. We lost our car and we're behind on rent and all the other bills also. But still I give faithfully because The Rock is my family and it's freed me to be the mother that I'm supposed to be and leave behind the old style of life from drugs and alcohol and restored my family back to me. And there's no amount of money that could ever do that. I'm blessed and so excited to say that since I've been giving the freedom of the future, uh, I'm happy to say that God is so faithful has blessed us with a car. And not only that, my landlord called me today to say that the new buyer who bought our townhouse canceled the $2,300 that we owed and said, we'll start over at the very next month. <laughs> Shall men give on? I mean, can you imagine they're thinking, how am I gonna come up with this back rent? All of a sudden, God deals with this guy over here. He buys his townhouse. He comes along with a heart that says, let's forgive it. Shall men give on to your bosom? Now, it's kind of neat. It goes on and it says this part. I'll, I'll read it to you. I know that it's only God that this is possible. Thank you so much for to do this and teach us and, and so that we can learn to live, to serve God, be blessed. And she gives her name. I mean, just a tremendous thing that God is doing. See, God wants to use people to do something. Let me give you a little story that I heard a number of years ago, kind of a fascinating story. This guy is in a church up in Northern California. And uh, the, that particular church was raising money uh, for a project that the church needed to be involved in. And all the people were there. And the young man said, I just don't know what to do. I only make $400 a month, that's all. I rent a room from someone in the church, it costs me $200 a month, then I take the remaining $200 a month and I split it up so I have enough food to eat during the month and that's all I do is I eat top ramen, I eat stuff like that, but I'm able to pay the bill that I have on $400 a month, he exists. Now here comes the church making a statement that they want to raise finances. And he was talking to God and he said to God, God, I, I, I want to get involved, but there's no way I can get involved. No way 
I can't do this. I only have $400 a month. I don't have a car. I don't have a bicycle. Everywhere I go, I, I walk. Uh, and and I, I just don't have any ability. And God said to me, and it's what he's saying, God spoke in my heart. It was just like a little quick impulse that went into his heart. It's how it works with God. And all of a sudden it expands your thinking. And he felt like it was God. And God spoke this into his heart and said, what do you have? He says, well, that's my point, God. I don't have anything. So God said, what do you do? He says, I don't do anything. He says, well, how did you get to church? He said, well, I walked. Do you know that? I don't have a car. I walked to church. And he said, okay, then walk for me. And he couldn't figure out what that was all about. So he started a walk-a-thon. He contacted every person he knew, every person in the church, every person at work, every person that was a relative. And he said, listen, I'm going to walk for 20 four hours straight. And every mile I walk, will you give me 10 cents to help pay off this thing for our church and raise money for our church? And the people were so impressed. And he said, listen, if you make out your check to the church, you'd even get a cash a write-off at the end of the year. They said, well, that's a good deal. We won't give you 10 cents a mile. We'll give you a dollar amount. You know, they figure this guy's going to, what, walk 15 miles, 18 miles, 20 miles, 10 cents a mile is $2. No problem. But if I give him that, that's 20 bucks. No problem whatsoever. Some people said, hey, we won't give you a dollar a mile. We'll give you $10. One person said, I'll, I'll give you $100 a mile. And he couldn't believe it. And he started to walk and he tells the story for 24 hours. He was out there, but he couldn't make walking for 24 hours. He could only walk like 18 hours or 19 hours. Couldn't make the last four. He was too sore. Got a bunch of miles in, grateful for all of that. And when they added it all up that he brought into the church, it was thousands of dollars in one day's effort. What have you got? And just like, if you will, God used that man to bring thousands of dollars in doing what? With what he had as a job, his car, his what? Nothing. He just, what have you got? Some of you got old tent trailers that got more black widows in it than you've ever been in in your life. They're sleeping there all every night. You've only been there once in the last three years. Some of you have got all kinds of junk cars and uh, uh, driveways. You got motorcycles. You are the, America is the only place in the entire planet where we have storage units and we have movies about storage unit wars that uh, you know what I'm talking about. Yours is in line to be claimed by somebody next week. My goodness, we ought to do some things to make it something. God will use you somewhere to do something about it. I have a friend named John Burns. John Burns loves to support a ministry in, in Vancouver, British Columbia, where his church is. John's in his 60s, and he calls me every year and asks me to donate. And every year I don't want to, but I figure because I love him and believe in him, I'll do it. And he says, I'm going to raise money for Mercy Ministry, and uh, the only ability that I have is I'm going to play golf. Will you sponsor me for 50 cents a hole for as many holes as I can get in that day? I said, yeah, John, I'll, I'll do it. Well, anyway, this guy in, takes his golf clubs, puts them on his back, and he starts to hit the ball and runs and he runs all day long. He plays 100 holds of golf and running all day long with a golf club. Last year, his goal was to raise $1 million for Mercy Ministry. It takes people to make this work. It doesn't take people with excuses. It doesn't take people that are in their own personal pity parties. It takes people that says, you know, with God, all things are possible. I can do it with God. I can make something happen. I can create something. I can be used by God to do something. Most people don't have that initiative. 
Most people see themselves as where they're at, as if it'll never be anything different. And that's why we never get out of where we're at and go to where we need to be. You and I need to be a people that are smart enough. Last week, received a check from a woman. $3,500 check. Along with it was a note. A note for freedom for the future. She said, thank you for freedom for the future. I've been saving money for my own home. She says, I'm so tired of renting. I've just started to believe God a few years back to stop renting and own my own home. And the lady sent me this $3,500. And she took that $3,500 out of her savings and sent it to freedom in the future. Can I tell you something with God? That's holy money. That's, that's money that came from her heart. That's sacrificial giving that isn't just done out of religion, ceremonial ritual or tradition. That's something that came from her heart because she wanted to do it. She sacrificed what she wanted for God. Can I tell you something? I promise you, God will come through for her and she will own a home. So I don't even know who she is. Supernaturally. My goodness sakes alive. That's the kind of stuff we're talking about. God wants to use people. We forget that all the time. Shall men give on to your bosom? Instead of looking for God to drop it out of the sky, if we all get together, do something, this church will be. So, can I ask you a question? What could be bad? Listen to the question. What could be bad? One more time. What could be bad about a church paying off its mortgage, being free and clear for as long as it takes for Jesus to come back and winning souls, changing lives. This church has hundreds of thousands of people that have walked the aisle. We don't even count the street ministry, prison ministry. Don't count the hospitals, convalescent hospitals. Don't count hospital ministries. Don't count under the bridge ministry. Don't count food distribution centers. Don't count anything else. Just people walk into aisles of hundreds of thousands of people in the last 26 years. Did you know that this church is the number one soul winning church in America? Some tell us. Number one, listen, and that's an investment in the future. What's wrong with that? Can anybody in their right mind tell me that's bad? That's a good thing. And if it's a bad thing to you, keep your money. It's okay. We love you, want you to come to the party tonight, want you to know your family, and we adore you. There is no pressure in this place to give. If it can't come from your heart because you love God and you want to change the future for people, then can I just say something to you? Keep it. Because we love you enough and we'll still love you as much giving nothing as if you gave $10 million. There's no difference whatsoever. Just keep it. But those that want to do something good and pay it off this church you got to see it as a good thing. You got to see it as a God thing. You got to see it as it will open up doors to your future and set your heart free. It'll be where God sets a hedge of protection about you. And listen to this He will protect you from the devourer and the future that's out there to try to keep you from being all that God would have you to be. And this is a good thing, not a bad thing. Could somebody give me an amen on that? I want to make sure before anybody else gets up and leaves, church not over with yet, so let's just talk for a moment. I want to make sure before we bring that, and I dismiss you, that the most important part of today's service is making sure that every one of you that are here are right with God. Let's talk about that just for a moment. Wrong with God means you die and go to hell. Man, I don't want you to die and Go to hell. I don't want you to come into this place and hear the word and see the word of God on the overhead and carry a Bible and sing songs, clap your hands, and die and go to hell. Because you can't get to heaven because you came to church today. You get to heaven, Jesus tells us how. Listen closely, listen, listen, listen. 
You get to heaven because you're born again. Born again means this. You have given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. It always has been. You got to hear that again. It's an all or nothing. Don't let anybody kid you. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been. Always will be. God forgive us in American churches that we've watered that down. And I'll prove it to you all or nothing. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. You've heard of it. Jesus himself is speaking in the book of Revelation. He says, I'm coming again. And when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. My goodness, Jesus made a statement like that. That's a rude, crude statement. A lot of times we have this picture of Jesus. He's just so nice and sweet. He wouldn't say anything bad or hurt anybody. You know what? You got a wrong vision. He was in the face of those that were contrary to the ways of God and said it like it was. And he makes this statement. He says, either you're hot or cold because if you're lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. What he just really said is people that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all. And they're gonna get rejected by God. So what's lukewarm? Check it out for yourself. Lukewarm, let me define it for you. Lukewarm, a little in, a little up, a little out. Little up, a little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. You know you're not against God. No, no, you're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. God is just something in your life like everything else. Man, but he is not everything. You are lukewarm and you're in trouble and somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, honor you enough to tell you the truth. And I love you, respect you, and honor you enough to stop playing church and tell you the truth before it's too late. Because if you die in that condition, you will open your eyes in hell and someone needs to tell you the truth. Uh, today is your day of salvation. And the only way it's gonna work is you're gonna have to give God all of your heart. You're gonna have to give God all of your life. He won't steal it from you because he's not a thief. He's not a crook to take it from you or a manipulator to come and get it from you, hit you in the head with a two by four until you cry, uncle. He won't do that. He says you have a free will choice. Your choice is whether to give it to him all of your heart or not give it to him. And it's your call, not mine, not the person next to you, no one else. It's your personal call because God doesn't want anybody in heaven that doesn't want to be there. And today, it's your day of salvation. And somebody loved you enough to tell you the truth. Somebody loves you enough to tell you the truth. Today is your day of salvation. And you might say to yourself, well, I don't know if I've given God all my heart or given God all my life. Well, if you don't know, then make sure. Get ready to put your hand up. You may say, I don't know if I've given God all of my life. Uh, I'm not, but make sure. Maybe you're one of those people that says, well, you know, I prayed with Billy Graham or I prayed with uh, uh, Harvest Crusade. Well, great. Can I just say something to you? Please don't treat God like he's an idiot. You can't just pray a prayer. God is in heaven and hears the prayer and goes, oh, they said the right little formula. They used all the right words. I'll let them in heaven because they said the right words. Come on, there's no abracadabra magical formula that you can repeat and get into heaven because this is not about your words, it's about your heart. God watches, listen to this, listen to this, listen, listen, listen. God watches your life that follows your heart to see whether or not you're real with him. And some of you today, you've prayed that prayer, but you've been living your own life and you know you need to stop messing with God and you need to give God all of your heart and give all of your life. And today is your day. God brought you here because it's a divine appointment you have with God. 
You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I get right with God? Well, let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll, I'll deny you. So in a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up, and I'll see your hand go up. All this family room is packed back here. I'll see your hands back there. All across this auditorium, I'll see you all across, all back in that family room, in the foyer, down at the Love Rock Cafe. If you're sitting on a bench out there in the plaza, I'm talking to you, and you can hear my voice. God's looking right now, and before God, you can get your hand up when you hear my hands pop together. So if you're one of those people that have been running from God instead of to God, Get ready to put your hand up. Never given him all of your heart. Get ready to put your hand up. Never given him all of your life. Oh, hold on. We'll do it all at the same time. People are already putting their hands up. Hold on. We'll do it all at the same time. If you've never given him all of your life, we'll do it all together. And today is your day. If you're one of those people that are not sure, make sure. You say, Pastor, wait a minute. Wait a minute. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yep. Get over it. Better to be embarrassed for a moment than to be in hell forever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees. No one is that stupid, but the devil says you are, and he's trying to talk you out of raising your hand right now. Today is your day of salvation. I'm finished. I've done my job. I'm counting. Here it is. One, two, Hey, let me see your hands. Let me see your hand. There's one, two, three, four, five. Thank you. Six. Thank you. There's seven. Thank you. There's eight. Thank you. God bless you. Nine. Thank you. Ten. Thank you. Anybody else back over here? Anybody else real quick? I saw them already. I already counted them. Thank you. Ten. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? There's another one back here. Eleven. Twelve. Thank you. Thirteen. Fourteen. God bless you. Fifteen. I think I already counted you though. That's okay. But I'll count you again because I love numbers. Anybody that's saved will just put up in their hands, just make me feel good. No, I just, I, there's 15 that need to get right with God. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Don't miss this. Anybody else? You can't do it for him. You've got to do it himself. I know how sometimes we love eat somebody. Please put your hand up. Put your hand up. It doesn't work that way. You can't get in heaven because your sister raised your hand or your brother raised your hand or your mother raised your hand. It doesn't work that way. So if you want to put your hand up by yourself, I'm cool with that. No? All right. All right. Another one down here. God bless you. Good, good, good. Anybody else? Let's give the Lord a great big praise. Okay. Now here's what we want to do. Here's what we want to do. All whatever number there is, 15 or 16. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible friend. Now watch me. Listen to me. If you are serious about God and you raised your hand, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get out of your seat, get in the aisle, meet me right here in front. If you're serious about God, if you know you're serious about God, you know you need to have, get your hand up, but you didn't raise your hand, you can come too. Check with your neighbor, say, come on, I'll go with you. And then every one of you that raised your hand, anybody that should have, get in the aisle, meet me right here in front. No one leave there in this period of time. No, no, don't do that. Don't want to leave because that would be rude. And every single one of you that raised your hand, let's stand and welcome them right now. Come on. Jesus, I believe. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Jesus, I belong to you. Come on, hold. Still come and give my hand as they come. That is so good. 
Isn't God good? All of you in front, put a smile on your face. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. You're not going to die and go to hell. You're going to die and go to heaven. Then that's a good thing. So smile. Over here to the left is Pastor Joel. He's going to pray with you, give you some free stuff, tell you about a program we have that will help you get strong in Jesus so you don't go back, fall through the cracks. Only takes a few moments. People you came with will wait for you. Is that okay? So make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.